Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the IndieSoft uh, webinar covering SCADA security best practices today. We're really glad that you could uh, join us today, and uh, we're excited to have our guest speaker, Mr. Vern Williams. And uh, what I'll we'll cover here is, uh, um, first of all, a quick introduction. My name is Scott Quartier. I'm the technical evangelist for IndieSoft. And I'll cover a brief company overview and uh, talk very briefly about uh, system security within IndieSoft Web Studio as a product. Uh, we've covered this uh, to some degree in previous webinars, and uh, I'll just mention briefly some of the features that we have within IndieSoft Web Studio for security, and then I'll hand it over to uh, Mr. Williams, who will then uh, discuss Industrial Control System Security, or ICS Control System Security, and uh, talk about security goals, incident responses, and key uh, SCADA questions for your CEO or uh, management of your company. And uh, just a little bit of logistics here on the webinar. Um, you um, uh, can ask us questions during the webinar. We'll answer those uh, towards the, the end of the presentation. Um, we cannot hear you, so you'll have to input those in the WebEx chat window or the uh, Q&A panel that uh, is offered by WebEx. So uh, please feel free to do that, and we'll answer those uh, at the tail end of the, uh, the webinar. And uh, for those of you who have never joined us on, on one of these webinars before, uh, we post the slides and a recording of the webinar and uh, make those available to you. We let you know where they're at. And uh, we also send you a survey that uh, upon filling that out and give us some feedback and giving us your name and your address, we will send you a free T-shirt just for joining today. So we appreciate you joining, and hopefully you get something out of this. I'm going to start um, by discussing what is what is Indusoft, who is Indusoft. Um, first of all, for uh, hopefully everybody knows, we are uh, a human machine interface, HMI, and SCADA software product uh, or company. We have some other products that uh, uh, are add-ons and, and complement what we do with that uh, product. Um, we were established in the U.S. in 1997, so we've been around a while. We have over 250,000 installations worldwide. And uh, we were first in the industry to have uh, SCADA and HMI products specifically for uh, Microsoft Windows CE. For those of you who are not familiar with Windows CE, it's an embedded operating system put up by Microsoft. Um, not meant to run as a desktop, but meant to run on embedded devices or often industrial devices. And um, uh, for us to have a product on that, we still still uh, are very active in product development for Windows CE. Uh, that helps keep our footprint and our memory usage uh, uh, very efficient, and we focus on that, and that, that helps the overall product stay very efficient and very uh, uh, quick. Um, in addition to that, we were the first in the industry to have a web solution and XML integration for HMI and SCADA. And that's um, more important now than ever to have remote access and to have um, uh, your operators and your maintenance staff be more efficient. They know, can know what's going on remotely uh, without having to be exactly on site at the machine, at the process. And this really uh, begins a discussion of, of what Mr. Williams will be talking about a little bit later um, as far as having connections from the outside coming in and, and things of that nature. So it's not only limited to, to outside because there are threats from the inside, as you'll hear him discuss, um, but I uh, wanted to bring that up. We also have a patent for our database connectivity. Uh, that's something that we, we do very well, uh, connect to databases, to log information, log usages and, and know how your machine or process is running. We're a Microsoft Gold certified partner. We're an OPC Foundation member since 1998. And we're also an ISO 9001-2008 registered firm. So we uh, document what we do internally and uh, make sure that we continue to do those processes to, to create a better product for you. Um, if I didn't mention it before, we're an easy to use HMI and SCADA software, and uh, this is important. A lot of people don't realize that uh, we are both or either, uh, that uh, we can be a very small HMI product or, uh, or develop small HMI applications, I should say, or very, very large, up to 10 million tag count um, 
uh, monitoring applications and supervisory applications. So, a uh, very scalable product. We run on any current Microsoft operating system, uh, 32 and 64 bits, and that includes uh, Windows CE and mobile embedded platforms, including Embedded XP, uh, Embedded 7, uh, Vista, Windows 7, Windows 8, and Server Editions, including 2008 R2 and uh, Server 2012 as well. Um, talking a brief amount about uh, system security within Indusoft Web Studio, <coughs> excuse me, what I, uh, what I wanted to mention or just kind of highlight is some security modes that we have to offer. And uh, again, for those of you who are looking about more information on uh, security within uh, Indusoft Web Studio, please uh, refer back to the uh, previous uh, webinars that we've given and the uh, uh, slideshows that we have online on our website and, the, uh, again, the videos. Um, I'm going to talk briefly, uh, but I'm going to leave most of the contents uh, to Mr. Williams. So, uh, again, we have uh, uh, four different security modes within Indusoft Web Studio, the local built-in security mode, and then two that are really built off of that, the distributed client and the server, and the client, uh, when you set that up, gets all of its uh, credential information from the uh, server. Um, the fourth type of, of security mode that we have is using the LDAP protocol. And uh, this is uh, one of the uh, things that uses the LDAP protocol is Microsoft Active Directory. Uh, other security systems uh, can use uh, LDAP as well, not just Microsoft Active Directory. We'll work with, uh, I believe it's called Atom in, uh, in Linux. And uh, But one of the things that this offers is when you uh, use this selection, the LDAP selection, and tie into, a, uh, let's say, a Microsoft domain server, uh, you can authenticate against the uh, Microsoft domain, and you don't have to necessarily manage users uh, and those credentials uh, coming from uh, the domain. So you can uh, tie those right into however you want to set up your security system within Indusoft Web Studio and let Microsoft Active Directory handle adding users and removing users and things of that nature. Um, uh, next thing is talking about uh, security groups settings. Within Indusoft Web Studio, we have the ability to add groups. We can add, for example, operators or maintenance staff or supervisor or engineers. And you have the ability to set the levels uh, the low level and the high level for both runtime and development environment. And you, with these checkboxes here, you can enable different uh, settings so that certain users can have access to maybe only certain parts of runtime um, activities. Um, and you can use these levels, for example, to hide uh, buttons on the screen so they can't even get to menus or uh, on screen, so that it takes a particular security level to get to the screen. And one of the things I wanted to point out is that uh, using the same security system, you can also block certain development aspects uh, within Indusoft Web Studio as well. And again, for more information, please uh, uh, feel free to go back and take a look at our uh, webinars that we've done in the past on security settings. Some other things that we have here uh, are, are also uh, some password options. So under Groups, Advanced, you can see here that you can set the minimum password size. Maybe you, you want to say that it's 6 or 8 or 10 or 12 characters um, for users to be able to log in. And maybe there's a minimum requirement of a number of special characters uh, that need to be used in the password, whether or not uh, numeric or alpha characters are required, and whether or not it's case sensitive. Uh, so you can have stronger password protection, uh, if you will. Um, also, password aging, we can set that up so that it uh, forces the user to uh, re-enter their password, let's say every week or every month, uh, so that they have to change those passwords. So uh, as you're hearing Mr. Williams talk about uh, passwords and how they get left out everywhere, um, <clears throat> this is something good to, to kind of help uh, uh, reduce those uh, uh, passwords being left around. And some more information uh, under this other tab here. Uh, we can have it force the user to be logged off after uh, their last action, uh, whether it be input from a keyboard or mouse, uh, touch screen, uh, or from when they logged in. So we have the ability to uh, uh, help uh, with logons and, and logging people off and, and get uh, uh, some security things set up that way as well. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mr. Williams. There you go. We can see the, the WebEx, yes. Okay, great. 
but I want to thank, uh, nice to uh, see you all today, or at least uh, talk with you. Um, my uh, introduction, basically, uh, Californian by birth. Uh, after I retired from the Navy, got here to Texas as soon as I could, and while I was in the Navy, I got a o- degree in oceanography, and then uh, was uh, made a nuclear engineer by Admiral Rickover, uh, and that was where I first encountered uh, industrial control systems, uh, both at the prototype in uh, 1975 and then on real submarines uh, through the rest of my career. My first job uh, on board a ship was the reactor controls division officer, and uh, we had all of the reactor controls for the nuclear submarine to uh, maintain and operate. Uh, quite an education. Um, so drove submarines for most of my time in the Navy. Uh, since I got to Austin here in Texas, uh, uh, I've been active in both uh, IT and IT security and then also industrial control systems. We had a conference and had a, a, a back in 2005 where we brought in uh, folks from Sandia Labs to uh, present on that as a very early uh, topic. Also involved as a disaster relief coordinator by the Austin with the Austin Disaster Relief Network. Um, in fact, we still have folks up in uh, Oklahoma helping those who were hit by the tornado. Of course, it's possible that the uh, disaster we could be recovering from would be one that was caused by an industrial control system that had been compromised and and uh, by some hacktivists or something. Uh, I am currently the Chief Security Officer for Cyber Defenses and uh, developing a uh, uh, control systems uh, practice and uh, IT practice in general as well as uh, working with the uh, um, certifying and accrediting systems. Okay. Getting on to the industrial control systems. Um, the interesting p- fact about industrial control systems is they are in a unique position between the uh, bits and the bytes and the physical world. Uh, a, an attack in the cyber world, in this case, can have immediate and very serious effects in the physical world. Uh, so the consequences can be much more severe than loss of a database or um, you know, failure of access for people to get to their computers. It can be plants uh, shutting down and you know, having thousands of dollars a minute wasted. Uh, it can be uh, plants blowing up. It can be wastewater being dumped where it's not supposed to be. Um, and to differentiate this from an IT system where they're used to changing things out every three to five years and you've got something new to, to work with, uh, life cycles on industrial control systems are five to 30 years. Uh, some of those uh, things have been around uh, so long we no longer have anybody who understands what's really going on, but we continue to use them because they work. They're not broken. Um, so, but industrial control systems environment has changed. The, uh, the bubble that they used to operate in where they were isolated from everything else uh, has been penetrated. When the business people are uh, the, the ones who have desired information from the uh, control system and uh, have connected the business network to the control system network and that, of course, they're already out on the Internet. Um, now, uh, let's look at the threats to the industrial control systems and how we can defend them from the evil in the world. So, how bad is it really? Well, uh, we were going along fine until Luigi basically put a laundry list of unpatched vulnerabilities and then detailed proof of concept exploits. Uh, Six major SCADA systems, one of them Rockwell Automation, um, and um, he wasn't even the least bit sorry that he had basically given a primer to hacktivists to uh, uh, cause damage to folks little history of, you know, where has this happened? And one of the areas that we're seeing a lot of interest is in the water and wastewater, which has very little security wrapped around it, often, you know, uh, available across the Internet. Uh, And this is just a sample of a few uh, 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 occurrences that have happened uh, in the not-too-distant past. Uh, The sewage spill at Maruchi Shire uh, was a case of a disgruntled former employee who knew how to get in via wireless. And uh, he went in and uh, dumped a lot of wastewater where it shouldn't be and uh, caused uh, both a lot of embarrassment and and a lot of expense for a huge number of people. So we've got serious problems. We've got people who are trying to take advantage of them. And then in the uh, electrical infrastructure area, 
Uh, they did a survey, and the survey came back with 30% believing their company was not prepared for a cyber attack and 40% expecting one in the next year. I'm hoping that the 40% that expect one are prepared, but uh, no guarantee of that for sure. Uh, recently, they had a uh, call where uh, the question was not how do we, you know, how are the bad guys getting into our networks, but the bad guys were trying to establish uh, alternate paths of communication to existing uh, software that had already penetrated. Uh, this is a scene of what can happen, not when somebody, you know, a, a terrorist comes in and tries to destroy your, your facility, but when, because somebody failed to pass something on during shift change and a level instrument failed, a uh, Texas City uh, explosion uh, killed a lot of people, and, uh, and it actually could have been much worse if it had happened uh, during shift change. Uh, so if the you know, the terrorists are after you. They'll plan it during shift change. They can get twice as many people that way. So uh, that would be the easy thing to do. Um, we had recently a uh, something that you can't talk about ICS security without at least mentioning, and that's Stuxnet and its variants. Uh, Stuxnet uh, had four uh, zero-day attacks against Microsoft systems, uh, had two root kits, and required no command and control. It was an autonomous piece of malware. And uh, we believe uh, you know, that it got spread uh, through a laptop being connected inside the security perimeter. So this, you know, talking about is it inside or is it outside? Well, where did the person walk into to connect into your network or were they having to go through your firewall? Um, so Stuxnet, um, did a lot of damage, but it did it in an interesting way. It basically presented, it recorded normal, then it presented normal back to the operators so that they thought everything was fine while Stuxnet was busy destroying material and uh, then destroyed the centrifuges by operating them at a harmonic frequency. Um, that um, not being enough, uh, when they thought they had it uh, gotten rid of, um, they replaced the centrifuges, brought it back up online, and lo and behold, there was a return of Stuxnet, and uh, it uh, came back to do, all, do it all over again. Um, now, uh, here in the U.S., the Department of Homeland Security is putting out warnings about, warnings about uh, increases in malicious activity, um, and they're in encouraging people to be proactive in their security. One of them they specifically mentioned is authentication controls. I'm a real advocate of multi-factor authentication. Um, it's, if somebody you know, compromises your user ID and password, they can use that to log in from the outside, log in from the inside, wherever they happen to be. Uh, if you require a fingerprint at the time you log in, uh, then that makes it much more difficult to uh, get a live fingerprint to, uh, to log in with. Um, so the number of tools are being increased and you know the internet is great for you know us communicating with each other it's also great for the bad guys to communicate with each other and share their tools and the hacktivists are saying gee this might be an interesting way to ruin people's days so they're um, looking at the online access to ICS's and the tools available and taking advantage of them looking at some of the exploit uh, kits and who's affected um, they, um, the exploit kit that was made available affected GE, Rockwell, Snyder Electric, and Coyo. There was another exploit that was built for Ethernet IP protocols and used by a number of, that are used by a number of PLC vendors. Uh, additionally, uh, there's a backdoor in, in the CodeAssist ladder logic system that's used by 261 PLC manufacturers to execute ladder logic. Now, they've come out with a uh, fix to that. But the question is, have the manufacturers fixed their products so that it doesn't use the old and vulnerable? Uh, and that's a good question to be asking on any, uh, any of your products that you're using. So what else do we have to worry about? Kaspersky Labs um, labels Dooku, Flame, Gauss, and Mini Flame as uh, potentially developed by this U.S. cyber weapons factory. Uh, and I will neither confirm nor deny that. Uh, but that's what they think. 
2012, uh, ICS CERT tracked 171 vulnerabilities. So there's quite a few of them out there. Shodan is an interesting tool. It uh, scans the internet looking for uh, systems and you can pick what vulnerability you're looking to exploit and what systems are vulnerable to that and it'll let you know, give you a list. So, and then the last one is Shamoon, unfortunately, well, fortunately for Saudi Aramco, um, did not get to the control systems, but it did destroy 30,000 uh, computers these were in their business operations outside of the industrial control systems. Um, that is a huge loss. They basically had to pull out the old hard drives, put new ones in, and then reconfigure them. I'm certainly hoping they had a gold disk of how they wanted them deployed, or that was a lot more work. Uh, can we continue this? I don't think so. Status quo, it's broken, and we need to quit doing the same things so that we can have some success in the future. Um, one thing that's very important is working together with the uh, IT and corporate security to really make it harder for the bad guys. Um, in a number of assessments I've done, uh, I've seen that a lot of the vulnerabilities that we have or the exposure is between the silos. So if you've got a, an ICS operational silo and you've got an IT security silo and you've got a physical security silo, then somebody will be able to walk in and walk into a closet, a communications closet, connect into the network, and then they're on the inside now. And if your corporate security isn't keeping that locked and monitored, that's a problem. Uh, there's one thing that we have to all agree to, and that's that the only thing worse than our guys not controlling the network and controlling the industrial control systems, it's having them control it. Uh, they don't have our best interests at mind, and uh, they have... Uh, no concerns about uh, our job security. So what can we do? We'll get to the proactive actions that we can take. First is, by policy, practice defense in depth. What that means is that you uh, write in your documents that say how things are going to be done in your network to uh, require uh, defense in depth, multiple layers of protections. You, you, know, you have a firewall between the Internet and the DMZ, another one between the DMZ and the business network, another firewall between that network and your industrial control systems uh, network. Uh, and you may even have what's called a uh, data diode, which allows only uh, communications to come out from your um, uh, safe system safety uh, equipment. So, uh, and then one of the things we saw happen in the uh, Stuxnet was they bypassed controls. They, somebody brought a laptop and plugged it into the network, and lo and behold, it was, it was now infected. Uh, so making sure that the employees are educated, you know, told, and, and you know, have to uh, agree to um, maintain the rules, um, and then establish accountability for, as, at, for actions. Um, one of the things that's interesting and this is part of the you know, building security into your, your entire system. Uh, there's a, a company that will remain nameless that uh, was going to perform the upgrades to four Windows systems, and they were charging $10,000 a piece. And after they got done, the uh, customer scanned their system, and they found that some of the patches weren't, in fact, installed. So they called them back and had them finish it up. Well, the corrective action was... The agreement now list said that the customer couldn't scan the uh, patched network or patched, sy patched systems after they did their work. Uh, somehow that doesn't seem to be the right answer. So if the contractor wants to leave you vulnerable, maybe you ought to look at another contractor or at least hold their feet to the fire and write a contract that uh, makes them do what, what you need them to do to, keep, to stay secure. Uh, one other thing that's kind of interesting, we saw this uh, out here in one of our power plants. They went back and they did um, the identity uh, proofing. I, they you know, check references and stuff because they hadn't done a good job of that the first time. And one of the employees that they were looking to give access to their, in fact, had access for a couple of years, uh, turned out to be a convicted felon that had given false credentials when he um, hired on with the company. Um, that is something that you need to take a look at 
don't just say, well, Joe's been here for two years, so we, you know, he's a good guy and we can give him credentials. Go ahead and go through that step of validating uh, the identity information itself. What are our goals? In the area of security, we need to get uh, security uh, in the policy, make sure you develop or review the ones you have, make sure that they're effective, and kind of have to monitor and measure them to know that. The other thing is we want to architect a robust industrial control system environment. I tend to find that people are very concerned about availability, not so much concerned about confidentiality or identity management. Uh, but you want to put all the controls in the right places to protect the very valuable stuff more than just the routine stuff. Um, and then in your contracts with both your providers, equipment providers, uh, and the uh, integrators, make sure that your security concerns are built into the contract, that they're contractually required to do things to support your security goals. Um, providers have a, a you know of software or equipment have another responsibility and that's not to sell you stuff that hasn't been developed well we had uh, some testers that we were trying to take from the you know uh, compliance or the performance testing of a plus b equals c check that's right move on to what if not a and or not b was put in uh, what happens to the system does it crash and reboot with a system prompt for the attacker, uh, not a good thing. So good coding standards, um, code reviews, those kinds of things need to be practiced by the people that are selling you software uh, and hardware. Well, in fact, if you look at it, hardware always has some kind of software on it. Um, even, even FPGAs, which I had a chance to work with for a while, uh, that's effectively software deployed into hardware. So that's a very important issue. Um, and then training. I you know, kind of put the blame on us if we haven't told people what the rules are and then trained them on how to and give them the ability uh, to comply with it. Had a situation where we required a, a review of access uh, uh, by all the employees in each of the divisions, and um, we had seven different identity management systems that people had to look at only problem was we only gave them tools for one out of seven. So that was a bad on our side uh, because obviously we did not equip them to be successful. And that's our goal. Uh, then requiring accountability. Uh, knowing who it is and being able to hold accountable, uh, you know, we still are in the, the, you know, if you look at the statistics, the majority of system failures or outages are caused by human error. You know, we don't do something right. There's a couple of reasons for that. But you want to make sure that you can know who did it so that at least you can retrain them so they don't do it again. Um, and then, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm not confident enough to say nobody's going to ever get in or my system's never going to fail. Uh, so training and uh, developing an incident response team is very important. And that's what we're going to go now. We're going to look at incident response, kind of the current state. It's divided typically into... Uh, uh, three different areas. You've got your physical area, which is you know fire, flooding, tornadoes, etc. Um, and that you know re, you know you got uh, ambulances and fire trucks and and all of that kind of stuff. You have to coordinate to put out the fires. Um, and then there's the guys on the cyber side who you know try to prevent at least our stuff from causing those fires. Not that we can prevent tornadoes or anything, but we wish. Um, so the cyber incident response is well developed and. Uh, the U.S. CERT and the uh, CERT at uh, Carnegie Mellon University have, have done an excellent job of working out the bugs and how this is done right. ICS CERT has the advantage of all of that, plus the uh, training of all of the control systems engineers that are involved. Um, and they sit, in fact, next to the uh, the cyber incident folks so they can you know, share stuff uh, very easily. Uh, it's... Um, uh, so we want to get on to what we need to do, and basically there's three major phases. Yeah, three of them are when there isn't an incident going on, and then you get into incident management, detecting, identifying it, uh, containing the damage, uh, fixing it, and then recovering back to normal operations. Uh, but that feeds into your post-incident analysis, 
which ha- you know is uh, lessons learned for your planning and your updates to your uh, to your incident response plan, maybe to your equipment. You may find you were not able to monitor something that you needed to, uh, and then. Uh, the incident pr- prevention, and I would I would start with basic planning and then look for the uh, low hanging fruit. And this is uh, the, something that uh, NIST put out. It's basically uh, what I just described in a in an, a graphical uh, view. Very important to stay in the green. So where do we start with this? Uh, we want to achieve a capability to respond when something goes wrong. We've got existing resources. We have very talented people, both in the IT security side and forensics, uh, control systems, and we need to get them working together to de- bring the right resources to bear uh, and uh, handle the uh, incident. Uh, important in that is developing an incident response plan. Uh, and you need to have everybody involved, all the players, so that you uh, each has you know, a sense of ownership. Key areas where we uh, we focus right now, your emergency management uh, folks are in, uh, in the physical security area, loss prevention, fire protection, emergency operations center staff, you know, they're set to respond to the physical effects. Cyber incidents, uh, IT help desk, often the first place you will see the, the symptoms of an incident, um, and the antivirus may alert you to that. Uh, but the IT help desk can be, and in the case of control systems, you know, it's your operational folks that are sitting there at the console, and they see something that looks weird, and you know, they got to raise their hand and say, hey, guys, let's take a look at this. How you handle USBs, that's a very easy way to bypass security controls. Um, and then there's those networks and security controls that uh, harden each of the systems. Um, we work with a number of, of uh, customers who... Uh, have to harden their their systems to what they call the STIGs or uh, security technical information guides, and, and that basically gives you all the, the the changes in the configuration you need to put in place. In the forensics arena, that's kind of figuring out who did it, and uh, uh, in some cases that may help you figure out the root cause as well. Um, and then change management. I like to bring that up, and you'll see it twice here, both under incident response and uh, ICS operations. Uh, and that's one of the you know, things that you know, the ICS folks do well. Uh, control systems are very concerned about change. Um, the IT uh, world could learn a lot from that, and I try to p- uh, press that uh, with them whenever I get a chance. Uh, with ICS, though, typically uh, strong physical access controls, but re- weak encryption and uh, identity management. And you do have those long life cycles, which means you may end up living with a problem system for a long time. Let's take a look at those obstacles. Um, unfortunately, the uh, InfoSec uh, community um, has gendered some ill will from the industrial control system staff. Uh, some energetic young uh, IT security guy comes in and says, uh, I'm going to scan uh, your systems. And they knock something over uh, and then go, gee, yours wasn't very secure. And they walk away, leaving you to deal with the carnage. Uh, not a good way to do business. Uh, and fortunately, we're developing controls that are more sensitive to the uniquenesses of the industrial control systems protocols uh, and the uh, the, the devices themselves. Um, so that's uh, a, a good uh, a good point in time now that we actually are seeing more things to, to help with that. Uh, one of the big arguments has been, you know, the, that OODA loop, the, the response curve, you know, being able to get the change sent back out to that valve to adjust the temperature uh, versus encryption. Well, we've got encryption that will do line speed uh, at you know uh, megabits rates, and most eye control systems aren't using signals that or measurements that involve megabits, so we can handle the increase, the very very slight increase in the response time. Uh, in fact, some tech cases you can improve it by increasing the speed of the uh, uh, of the transport. Uh, the other one is 
the controversy between easy, or easy operator access, and in some cases where the the quote unquote operator is logged in 24/7, uh, and people check in and take the seat of the operator, so you really have no accountability, no tie to an identity. Um, and we've gotten some very interesting tools in place that are very robust uh, and will do multi-factor authentication and not take a long time to get somebody uh, into the system. Um, you don't have to remember your password anymore, and, and those you know, just depend. Uh, so that's a capability that we can apply. Getting into ICS, it's kind of a new industry, ICS security, um, and there are a number of new players on the street, and finding ones who know what they're talking about and uh, have the right answers is important. Uh, as well, we're beginning to see more products that address security. Uh, there's you know, the firewalls that are designed to handle ICS protocols, um, and you've got the uh, data diodes that basically isolate uh, the sensitive components from the upper side. And the way they do that is they basically have a fiber that only has a send on one side and receive on the other, and there's no alternate path to take information back. Now, you've got to kind of fool the protocols. You've got TCP, IP likes to have, you know, connections that are going both ways. Otherwise, you don't get a, connect, uh, a session set up. Um, so this is... Uh, it kind of fools the uh, TCP IP session. It thinks it's connecting, uh, and it's uh, really only going one way. Um, so we want to remember it's very important that we uh, not let them have control of our networks. And if you know, uh, and you know, if we do at risk, put at risk connecting, you know, having our own control, uh, then at least they haven't got a, got a hold of it. So let's get started. First thing we need is we need the executives, and I've provided some questions uh, later that you can, you know, basically pose. Now your environment will may change them a little bit, but um, get the executive uh, branch of your company, part of your company, uh, on board uh, with uh, both uh, time for people and money for products. And if you look at time for people, it turns into money anyway. So forming the team, uh, my recommendation is. To provide incentive, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, food at the meetings, or it's uh, some additional equipment, uh, uh, a mobile device that nobody else gets, or something like that. We've seen some very uh, good uses of that in the um, emergency man emergency operations space, where you can send reports up very easily, um, and then develop a plan and. You know, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, and plagiarism, as far as I'm concerned, is the sincerest form of compliment. A lot of people have made these available. You can get them from NIST. Uh, you can get them from, you know, there's some real good documents. There's a, a recent revision, and I've got the references later, um, to their ICS uh, security document. Um, but use that um, and then modify it as you need for your organization um, but don't worry about having it perfect before you put it in place. As you train your staff and you exercise, then you'll begin to get that. Now, there, you know, there are some things that your staff will need to be trained on that they haven't had exposure to. Uh, I teach the CISSP course, Certified Information System Security Professional, uh, and that's a good broad uh, security primer for people that are going to be dealing with that. Uh, but there's specific training about how to use tools, you know, how to configure the ICS firewalls, uh, and make sure that the people that you're asking to do this get trained to be able to do it successfully. Um, and then outsourcing, in other words, relationships with companies that uh, provide services in this arena um, may be able to uh, help you by having somebody who can be called in in case you have, you know, gets outside your ability. Uh, and the other communication kit channel you want is with the local authorities. Um, you know, you don't want to have to find out who uh, is, you know, uh, who who's going to, you know, put a perimeter around your facility uh, when it uh, when it's too late and it's already happening. And then uh, exercise, uh, get feedback, feed it back into your plan, into your training. 
uh, and then you know test it in another exercise. Um, you know, quarterly is probably a good frequency, um, and then once a year or so, maybe bring in somebody from the outside to uh, bring a different uh, perspective. Someone who's seen a lot of companies trying to do this, and uh, they may have some suggestions on on how you can do it better. Who to involve? Uh, team members, you need somebody in charge, um, and I'll stress this again, but. Uh, you want somebody who is running things and has, you know, everybody reporting to them during this kind of an event. Um, you want your processor control system engineers. They know the systems. They know what it's supposed to look like. Uh, your network and system admins. Uh, again, they're the ones that know the, the routing protocols. They know how the network's set up. They know how the systems are configured. Plan management, CIO, chief engineer. You know, they're, they're your reference and your your. Um, Sanity check. If you come up with an idea, run it past them. If it, you know, if, it, if they, you can't explain it to them, then maybe you need to think about it a little more. Um, and then SMEs, uh, subject matter experts in both security and in the legal arena. Uh, you know, if you're trying to prosecute somebody from for uh, causing a lot of damage to your systems, uh, it's good to make sure you have chain of custody of the evidence so that um, you can get it admitted into court. And then your Public relations and human relations specialists, uh, those are folks that uh, can help you uh, get the right uh, information out to the right people. Uh, and then your vendor, uh, they've got support engineers, they've got you know, help desk, they've got some additional knowledge about the ins in inner workings, and they can, you know, can help you with that as well. So let's get started. We'll work out the bugs as we go. Um, you want to have, you know, kind of each of the phases we talked about, you want to provide a guide that kind of walks them through what they need to be doing when they're, you know, in the, the detection phase, you know, the, when they're in the remediation phase. Um, checklists are good to make sure you don't forget something. Um, there's no security. You, know, you don't ensure security by going through a checklist, uh, but you can definitely, if you forget something, uh, result in a loss of security. Uh, and then when it comes to standardized reports, don't make it hard. Make it an easy check block. Uh, we, in the emergency management space, uh, we set up mobile devices to take incident reports from the scene where we'd use the built-in camera, we'd use the built-in email, we'd use in forms that we, we populated where you could click check boxes on the touch screen and you could you know, type in a few sentences and suddenly you have a report, and then you can actually look at it and see what you know what it is that really happened. Those outside contacts with the law enforcement, fire, um, you know, hazardous materials, those kinds of guys uh, need to make sure that you develop those uh, communications methods. Sometimes when you've had a, a problem, the normal communication path won't work. Good example of this is cell phones. If you can't make a call you may be able to send a text message. And so that's a backup that will work even when all of the connections to the cell tower are uh, used. Someone has to be in charge. If two people are in charge, then really no one's in charge. So find somebody. They're the one that make the decisions and the relay information to management. Realistic scenarios, particularly ones that have actually happened to you, uh, are excellent for exercising the rest of your team or if you have turnover for teaching them what the the problem looked like uh, you had last time. And then there are folks that can develop exercises because they've seen them in the real world and can help you out with that as well. Okay, we've talked about when something goes bad, how to respond. What else can we do? Uh, assess, assessing your vulnerabilities, taking a look at what you've got out there, looking at the configuration of the server that's running your HMI, uh, look at the workstations, make sure that you know they're, the gold standard has been applied to those and that they're properly you know, locked down so that they you know, can't do things you don't want them to. Um, if you find something that can be fixed, fix it. If you've got an unlocked uh, communications cabinet, make sure it gets a lock and make sure you've got, you know, some way to know if somebody's got the door open. Uh, sometimes, you know, I've got done assessments where, 
you know, well, we've got physical security, and you walk into the loading dock, and they've got the door propped open so a fan can blow it in because it's too hot. Um, walk around. Look at, you know, the, the spaces. Build your systems with security in mind. Uh, architect the firewalls between, you know, the business network and the Internet, between the business network and your control systems. Have a DMZ where everything terminates before it goes out and where everything terminates before it gets in. Um, have firewall appliances or, you know, now they're, they're going to um, uh, kind of uh, combined uh, appliances that do everything for you uh, and, and compare those on a third party uh, to see what's, what's working best. They kind of leapfrog each other and depending on when it is, you know, each one may, may be better than the other. I really like encryption on communication lines because it makes sure that, one, the people can't find out what controls affect your devices. And, two, uh, if it's encrypted, they can't get break in the line and send something uh, to the device to make it change because their device isn't listening to anything until it gets decrypted. So that's, uh, that's a good uh, uh, prospect. Um, identity. You know, if you don't know who is doing it, you don't, don't know much, and it's hard to limit actions if you don't have that identity information. So how do you get the CEO's attention? Well, a few things you can ask them about. Find out what the current level and business impact of cyber risk to your company are. Um, business impact to the, um, uh, the ICS networks. Uh, what's the plan to, to identify and, and to address those identified risks? Um, how does your uh, cybersecurity program apply industrial, industrial standards and best uh, practices? There's a lot of information up there on the uh, NIST.org uh, website that, and on the ICS website, and on the ICS JWG website that you can take directly and apply to the way you're doing business. And um, they put it out there to try to help everyone get better. Um, and then what do we see normally? Um, what point do we tell the executive leadership that we've got a problem? Do we wait until the n newspaper or the you know, 6 o'clock news uh, comes across and lets you know that the plant's uh, uh, shut down? Uh, no, probably not. Not if you like to keep your job. Uh, and then... The cyber response plan, you know, how often do we test it? Uh, you know, do they know you have one? Do you have one? So those are a few of the things that have been brought up as questions to ask to your executive leadership. And then in kind of a caution, uh, when we practice, uh, we typically don't do as well when we're under pressure. Uh, in the area of firearms and, and, and accuracy, shooting competitions, typically the best you're going to do is 80% of what you do in practice. So you need to practice so that 85% of that is going to be enough, going to be okay. And you need to train the way you expect to deal with a real incident. Don't put abnormalities around it. Uh, and learn to fight wounded. Learn to, to deal with an, uh, an incident even when your you know, guru of all things industrial control happens to be in Hawaii. I used to use the example of run over by a bus, but that you know, people didn't like that. So uh, we'll put, assume they're on vacation and enjoying the beaches while your plant is coming down around your ears. A few references are included here, uh, and they've just come out with a revision to uh, the 882. Uh, it's got a lot of good information in it. And then uh, I've got several other uh, references here that you can use to help improve uh, the security of your uh, systems and the protect protections and networks that are around them. At this point, I think we're going to be uh, dealing with some questions. Here's my information. Scott? Vern, thank you very much. Yeah, sorry, I had uh, double security going on. I had two different mute <laughs> buttons pressed. Um, <laughs> uh, if I could ask you, one of the questions that we had in this morning's uh, presentation, if I could get, ask you to go back a slide uh, uh, sure. that has the different information on it. One of the questions that we had in this morning's presentation was, um, 
where are some more resources that I can uh, get more information? And these are these are great resources. Um, I don't know if you can bring up anything uh, additional to this, but uh, this is uh, we're recording this. This is going to be a, a video that we're going to post, and we'll post sure. the uh, the slide slideshow so that uh, customers can come by and get more references right. or, or get a more detailed look to this. So I'm going to have you stick on this slide while we talk a bit. Um, yeah, I, again, I don't. For I don't, those of you, oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, I don't have anything that I could could you know, bring up immediately on on the slideware, but uh, there, there, the ISA organization has ISA 99, which is their security standards for control systems, and they in fact have uh, vetted some products that uh, you know they've they've tested to make sure that they're they're uh, good for you know the security of ICS, and there's you know uh, Waterfall has uh, you know the uh, data diodes, uh, and Tofino has the firewalls, and they have a lot of information on their websites. And uh, we've got some additional resources that we can, you know, provide to you um, that, you know, give, just give you a list of, um, you know, sites that uh, you can take a look at. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was uh, something else that got brought up this morning. Um, um, is some of the industrial firewalls and things that uh, uh, many of us are not aware of. I've, I've been personally in, involved in industrial automation for over 25 years, consider myself to be kind of up on things. And uh, I, until recently, I wasn't even aware that industrialized firewalls existed, that you can get something that's DIN rail mountable, that uh, does packet inspection on different yes. industrial protocols, such as Modbus Ethernet or Modbus TCP and Ethernet IP. Um, so those are out there, and, and uh, we encourage uh, uh, our customers to go look for those. Something else that uh, I thought of while you were presenting is that uh, yes. probably one of the biggest uh, uh, problems is, is analysis paralysis, where people will sit in meetings and maybe uh, discuss and discuss and discuss and actually never deploy anything. Yeah, and that was part of what I was referring to when I said don't let perfect be the you know, enemy of, of good, uh, get something that you can, uh, you know, use uh, and then perfect it over time. Uh, and the same thing with, with, the, uh, with the products. Um, if you, you know, for example, there are some scanners now that have included industrial control systems uh, in their suite of tests that they'll run. So they'll run things against Modbus, TCP, et cetera, uh, and and give you that information. Uh, they haven't gotten into it from what I've seen. There's a uh, NSS Labs does tests of IDSs, AV products, uh, firewalls, uh, in you know products in the security space. Additionally, we have the um, uh, CCEVS, uh, basically the um, common criteria, uh, which is you know multinational. Uh, and uh, they have some products, they test products that way. Right now, I don't know of any that have been through the common criteria evaluation that are specifically industrial control system related. That's part of the new industry. Uh, it takes a fair amount of revenue to support sending, sending something up and getting it certified. Um, but we are making uh, some significant progress um, uh, in in getting scanners, like I said, to be able to see vulnerabilities. Uh, recently, um, now off, off the top, I'm, I'm having. Uh, I just lost the name of the product, but uh, but they've added that to uh, some of the uh, uh, hacking products. You know, the the ones you use as a pen tester. Uh, they've added modules specifically focused on industrial control systems. Great, good information. A uh, question that we've had come in is, what are best practices when it comes to using USB memory? Well, USB devices um, inherently are a physical bypass. Now, one of the controls that you can put in place is that you can actually lock down through group policies or uh, specific settings USB devices uh, for control systems. So you can prevent them from being used in that arena, 
the problem comes in is to, okay, now how do I get, um, you know, patches and updates, which I want to do, onto the network so that I can have, uh, have access. There was a company that had a solution where they would put a box inside your network, build a tunnel out through your firewall. Uh, the one problem I had with them was that they didn't have multi-factor authentication for the engineers that were accessing the portal to get into your network. Uh, so anything that bypasses your controls, you have to be very suspicious about and uh, work to build adequate ways to get the job done. Um, and one of the things you might do is you might have a, a scanning station that, uh, you know, before any USB gets, you know, brought inside the perimeter, it's got to go through a scan by, you know, uh, and typically the antivirus products or the scanning products, UTM, you know, Unified Threat Management products, um, uh, catch a percentage of the, you know, the problems that are out there. There's one other method that I, that I really like, and that's uh, to use whitelisting on your critical boxes. These don't change a lot, so they're very, um, you know, good uh, candidates for whitelisting. Whitelisting basically means that the kernel of your system knows what processes are supposed to occur and doesn't let anything else happen, like, uh, you know, deleting your C drive is not an authorized action. So it physically stops it from happening before it causes damage. So that's another tool that, you know, a best practice that um, has been used in the IT world uh, that I think is well-suited for systems. One other that I would recommend from the standpoint of architecting a secure and reliable system is using virtualization. Um, if I've got two hosts and each of them has the ability to run, you know, either or your HMI and your historian and or both, then when you want to patch a system, you move them both over to one system at a low volume of activity time, you patch it, and then you move them back over. If something happens, you move them back to where they were, um, and then you can, if one system fails, that, that you know, gives you redundancy down to the hardware level, processor level, memory level for those particular applications. Just uh, another quick comment for myself on um, USB memory. Uh, you know, uh, it, it comes down to a matter of convenience versus security, and it, it doesn't have to. It, it, you can have both. And uh, quite often there might be an industrial computer, let's say, that has, uh, and you have a choice. Does that uh, industrial computer or, or any computer for that matter have the USB ports or other ports exposed outside of the, the electrical panel? Uh, maybe it's yes. a choice that you make where those, those USB ports are not even exposed. Maybe it's a, a, a desktop computer or a, a computer that doesn't even have a display on it. Maybe it's industrial or not but it's yeah. inside the electrical enclosure behind a locked uh, uh, handle, let's say. And, and so physical those are security is, is very important. Um, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it cannot be stressed because you know, it's very difficult if someone can get unmonitored physical access to a box. For example, with not showing the USB on ports on the outside, I can still pop the cover and get in and plug something in there uh, even though the outside ports are not available. There are ways that you can tell the software not to uh, accept devices into those ports. Or one of the other methods is uh, you can actually have software that will prevent unauthorized um, and to the point that they're required to be encrypted on one of your systems. So, for example, if somebody needs to bring, you've got software that needs to come in, you bring it through a scanning system, then the scan system saves it out to an encrypted USB device that is acceptable to your SCADA systems, you know, the HMI, the, the Windows boxes that you're running uh, control systems on, then it will accept it. It won't accept anybody else, and it only reads stuff that's encrypted in a recognized key that's shared between those, you know, that, that scanning box and the, uh, uh, the control systems box, uh, servers themselves. Yep. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Another question that we had was, um, do we see 
uh, or uh, and I'm not familiar with this. Uh, do you use the C set at, at C S E T tool for risk assessments? Um, Absolutely. Vern, can you speak to that? I sure can. Okay. Uh, that's an excellent product that's been uh, developed and is available free for use. They're up to version uh, five, and uh, it basically walks you through. Now, I, I would. And it's not for the faint of heart. I would, you know, recommend that you. Uh, either get some training or uh, have someone that is is used to using this, um, you know, come in and assist you with it. Uh, you know, it, you want to have ownership of the process of doing the assessment, uh, but a, a subject matter expert who's done these before would be very useful. Get you across that. I really don't know what to do with this uh, question, uh, and and make it rather than a painful experience as you go through it the first time. Uh, you can you can make it very productive. So yes, I highly recommend the CSET tool as as an, an assessment method. Okay, um, we're being asked to if there's any specific software talking about uh, encrypting USB. What what I'd like to do is is offer whoever has that question to uh, contact us directly at uh, info at Indusoft, um, rather than promoting any uh, third party software products that maybe we don't right. know or or haven't tested. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, handle that offline. So, for uh, whoever had that question, please feel free to contact us directly. Um, That's good. Let's well, see. One other thing I, I did remember the product Metasploit yeah. is the uh, pen testing tool that has added uh, modules for control systems specifically. So, okay. a lot Great. of people Thank are you. familiar with that. Um, before we close, I don't see any other questions in. Uh, what I did want to mention is that uh, Indusoft. Web Studio is is capable of creating uh, applications that are 21 CFR Part 11 compliant. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that, that uh, adds the uh, traceability feature so that you can know who you which, which users did what and what made what changes. So um, there's a tech note on our website uh, revolving around that as well. And then uh, some other things that uh, we didn't mention: the the ability when using Web Thin clients to have uh, uh, secure uh, or HTTPS, uh, the secure socket layers through port 443. That's that's built in as well, and uh, we also have uh, security now built into the uh, remote management tools as well. So those are some things uh, that, that we've done over the past few years or so uh, within the product. So um, yeah, encryption is Bernard, your friend. Like, oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said encryption is your uh, friend. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, Vern, I'd like to thank you uh, for all of your, your help and your presentation here. Uh, at, at this point, I don't see any uh, further questions. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, we're just a little bit over the hour. We'd like to thank all of our attendees. And again, uh, please fill, fill out the uh, 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 survey when we send it to you. If you give us your name and address, you'll get a free T-shirt. And uh, we thank you for attending. Please feel free to let us know what you think about the webinars and uh, any inputs that you have on future webinars, feel free also to go back to our website and to our YouTube and take a look at the past webinars that we've done for the last couple of years on just about every topic you can imagine. So uh, we'd like to thank you guys and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you and hearing uh, from you on future webinars. Thanks and have a great day.